This has been a typical week for me. I've had Zoom calls with Every Nation leaders from different parts of Asia, from Africa, uh, from Latin America, and from here in the U.S., and a common question comes up, no matter what our agenda is, people want to know what I think about and have I experienced the Asbury Revival or the Asbury Awakening or the Asbury Outpouring is being called different things. And so I thought I would address that today. And um, I, I want to start with my first experience at Asbury. Uh, I was well aware that Asbury University and Asbury Seminary has had a history of revivals from the late 50s another one in the 70s, and then more recently, uh, really as I sit here today about three weeks ago, uh, the idea of revival awakening or outpouring has really gone global. Um, when I first went back to school, I was uh, 57 years old, I was on the Asbury campus for the first time um, in uh, 2016. And I remember taking the tour along with about 30 people in my cohort, and eight of us were Every Nation people from the U.S. and the Philippines. And we talked as we toured the campus, the, the seminary campus. See, the university is across the street from the seminary. And as we went through the seminary campus, it seemed like there was a prayer chapel in every building. I don't know if it's every building, but it seemed like they kept showing us when we would tour a building and they would take us to a prayer chapel. Then there were several standalone chapels that seated anywhere from 400 to a smaller one that was maybe in the hundreds. And it was uh, obviously prayer and worship and seeking God was a high value. And uh, I'm not a mystical person. Those who know me know this. I, I, um, I'm not mystical really uh, at very many moments, but I could even sense what I would call the spirit of prayer on that campus. There was such a sense of uh, the presence of God on a seminary campus. And uh, this is my third different institution in terms of seminary experience from Reformed Theological Seminary to Asia Theological Seminary and now here at Asbury Theological Seminary and it was just different. I don't know what else to say. Um, we spent, uh, me and the, the men in my cohort, we spent time in those chapels praying and kneeling and bowing and seeking God and crying out to God and, and those were some wonderful memories and experiences. Uh, but what happened three weeks ago on the university campus was another level. And I, I don't think these kind of awakenings or outpourings or revivals just happen out of nowhere. There's usually soil preparation, and I can certainly understand having for three years when I was uh, going to Asbury Seminary, uh, we would do a two-week residency each summer during that, that season of study. And, and there was always great times of prayer together and a sense of something, almost a holy ground type of, of feeling. And so today we want to talk about that. We want to talk about this idea of revival, which is what many people have called it. I appreciate Dr. Tennant, the president of Asbury Seminary, who refused to call this a revival. He said maybe in history we'll look back and, and see that it was a revival, but right now he was calling it an awakening, uh, God waking up sleepy Christians. And Others, I think Dr. Brown may have been calling it, the president of the, of the university, I think he may have been calling it um, an outpouring. And I also read Dr. Craig Keener refer to it as an outpouring. So uh, if you want to call it a revival, okay. If you want to call it an outpouring or an awakening or something else, again, I think we'll look back in history and see what really happened and what the results were. And I think a lot of people are waiting for the results before they label it something. But, but today, as we talk about this idea of revival or outpouring or moves of God among His people that have a broader impact than just the location, I've got two friends here, two colleagues who have both been there and experienced it. Uh, Dr. Delvin Pikes, is actually uh, serves on the Board of Regents or the Board of Directors, whatever it's called, at the university. Yeah. And uh, you can talk about that in a minute. And But we were classmates at um, in the D-Men program, and we experienced chapel and prayer and all of that together. And Delvin works here in Nashville as our Every Nation Campus Director for all the universities in this area in Middle Tennessee. And then Nick Jones. Uh, Nick is my colleague here in Nashville and a joy to work with. Nick is our camp, is our director of Every Nation Campus North America. And Nick canceled classes. Uh, we've got 20 some students here um, in, our, in our campus ministry school and Nick 
said, you know, instead of sitting in classroom talking about revival, let's just close camp and let's drive up to Wilmore, Kentucky, a few hours north, and let's experience it. So I just wanted to see what you guys' experiences were and, and how was that. So, uh, Delvin, you were telling me earlier about you were scheduled to preach. At what time and what happened? Yeah, so I, I, I saw what was happening on a Monday, the 20th. I was already on the docket to speak at chapel. Um, and, and this would have been uh, really towards the end of what they, they've uh, uh, went as far as uh, continuous prayer and worship uh, 24-7 almost. And uh, yeah, I, I, was, I was already scheduled. I heard all these different people, friends, want to drive up, are you, you going to go? And I said, well, actually, I'm going to be there anyway. Uh, and so the 19th, I had already planned to drive up. And Dr. Brown, the president, uh, called me and said, hey, when are you coming? Um, I would love to have you speak on the 19th. And so uh, for me, it was a special moment because that was actually when they were ending uh, the 24 you know, hour kind of services and uh, got to actually speak there on Sunday night. And it was just special, you know, just, uh, uh, not just special to be there then, but to see God moving on the hearts of young people and to see their responses. I mean, the altar, it was like waves. People were coming to the altar to be prayed for uh, it just in waves. Nick, what was, tell me your experience when you went up with all these campus ministry students. You know, it was pretty amazing because I came home and I told my kids, I said it was eight students. It was a routine chapel of what I've been told by different leaders that lingered at the altar. And the power of the few is what I felt the Lord really just remind me that I canceled class, as you mentioned, for the School of Campus Ministry for three days, drove three and a half hours for one way, spent a lot of money to put students in a hotel room, all because eight students stayed at the altar and cried out for Jesus to do something significant. And it's really hard to describe for me just words. It was to be in that environment of just felt such pure worship uh, led by the students. Delvin, you mentioned just the leadership. They led with such meekness and gentleness. They weren't harsh. There was a lot of conversations. They were easy to do housekeeping items, but they kept the room as a holy place sacred unto God. But the power of the few, I was just reminded of the history of the 1800s, of the Haystack Prayer Revival by five students. Mm -hmm. And so I'm sitting in the room and I'm like, Lord, I don't know what you're doing long term, but I do know you're doing something here. And I want to sit here as long as you allow me to sit here. So it was a pretty phenomenal moment. When you guys went, how long were the lines? I, I've heard stories, I've seen pictures of people waiting in line for hours yeah. to get in this chapel. Yeah, yeah, I heard stories, because uh, I got there on Sunday. Uh, it was a holiday weekend, uh, President's Day here in America. Um, and so the, Saturday, uh, I believe, and Sunday, uh, someone told me on the Saturday before that people had stayed in line nine hours uh, just to try to get into Hughes Memorial Auditorium that where. Uh, the cha this, this chapel kind of breakout started. And uh, yeah, the lines were massive. Uh, they had set up two large screen TVs out in the lawn for people to kind of watch what was happening live stream there. Four different uh, simulcast sites, uh, ac two across at the seminary and another two at churches. And so, you know, again, there was tens of thousands of people that had, had visited just that day. And people, uh, again, were coming from near and far. One of the fascinating things to me was just how global the impact is had. And to see people literally showed up that I spoke with that they rerouted their flights. One guy, one, one whole team of people, they were going to kind of uh, like have a minister's retreat almost and a, and a connection with, with other young ministers. And they rerouted a flight from Budapest, literally last leg, and said, we're going to go to Asbury and we need to get there right now. Oh, yeah, so, now, wait, when you say that now, people get images of Asbury. So yeah. we've been there. Asbury, how many stoplights are in the town of Wilmore where Asbury is? Two. Two. Okay, yeah, two yeah. stoplights. That's it. Yeah. It's, it's a seminary campus and a college campus, yeah. and they're not even big. I yeah. mean, the, the college is, what, 2,000? Yeah, a couple of thousand yeah, students. Yeah, it's yeah. not a large campus. Yeah. It is a tiny town yeah. that I read at one point there were 25,000 people yeah. a couple of days, yeah. which is larger than the campus the faculty, the seminary, the faculty, and everybody who lives in the town. Yeah. And it just overwhelmed this oh, little right. town of people yeah. coming. That, that's from all over the world to this. It, it, it's almost like, could anything good come out of Nazareth? <laughs> of these little outside, little nothing towns, and yet God picked something like that. It wasn't New York City. It wasn't Chicago. It wasn't 
L.A., although there have been revivals in all right. of those places, but yeah. this was interesting in that, that it was yeah. such a small place with such a large impact. Yeah. Nick, when you, we were talking, both of us were talking earlier about the student-led, mm -hmm. students started it by praying longer, the, the adults or the older people dismissed chapel, the, I guess there's a chaplain and, you know, a dean of chapel and all that, but yet these young people, probably, I guess, teenagers, I guess they're college students in America, 18, 19, 20, 21 years old, um, decided they needed more. They prayed more. Um, I know both of you all were talking about how the administration were guiding, but kind of staying out of the way and allowing the students to lead and all that. What, what, what did you see about that? What can we learn about that? Yeah. Well, I think, imagine you've got a 1500 seat auditorium with a balcony. Okay. So, what do we think? Maybe 1,200 seats on the bottom floor, the rest in the balcony. The university reserved, I think, probably the first eight to 10 rows for college students only uh, throughout the 24 hours. Unless you're a college student, you cannot sit in those seats. But then at nighttime, the chapel service got packed uh, around the 5 p.m. time frame. It was like, if you're going to get into Hughes Auditorium, you need to get before 5 p.m. Well, the first eight rows would get full, so then they would put all the students on stage. So you've got students all behind the small worship team that's leading us into worship. And the whole time I'm sitting there thinking, man, is someone else going to help take over? But I just felt the Lord just really challenged me and say, hey, this is the generation you're trying to reach. They have a voice. Let them speak. I'm speaking to them and through them and to you. And so that was powerful for me just to sit back and receive. I feel like the heavens were open. I mean, I was just scribing the entire time I was in the room. But then when they were assisted, and I think that's important, they were assisted. The students led this. Mm -hmm. uh, different staff, the university, when they assisted, it was with such gentleness. And they helped usher in different moments. And the last day I was there, I had a chance to meet uh, Delman's friend, Dr. Brown, the president of the university. And it was a very casual and quick conversation. I just said, thank you for protecting this for the next generation. And his wife uh, looked at me and said, thank you for saying that. We just left a meeting trying to figure out how to do this. Because as you mentioned, Delvin, there were thousands of people in line, various ages, trying to get into this. But the university, in my opinion, did a stellar job really fighting to keep this student led. And I know there's criticism coming from everywhere. Any, any time God does something, there are professional critics. And so I know that Dr. Brown, as the president, and the other leaders got criticized uh, brutally for even allowing this to happen. Okay, so that was wrong. But then others criticized him for what they said, shutting it down. When really it wasn't shut down, it was, we want to preserve this for the students. And, and I, read, I read what Dr. Brown wrote. I was very impressed uh, uh, that he put on, hit, what, he, what he put out was, we are stewards of these students mm -hmm. and this campus. Mm -hmm. And what we want is for what's happening here to spread to other university campuses. Mm -hmm. and, and, and he was, uh, it was a leadership lesson for me how focused he was on the people he was called to. Right. And everybody else wanted a piece of it. And they tried to do that the best they could, but ultimately, uh, what I heard in what he was writing, I'm going, I, I, I get that. I'm going to give an account to God and to my board and to the people who put this institution up for these people, not for all of that. And I think sometimes people want to take things and we think bigger is always better, and it's not necessarily. What is our stewardship? And I, I was really respected, um, Dr. Tennant, and Dr. Brown for the way they approached that and, and tried to accommodate but stayed focused on who they were called to reach. So, and, and as a part of the board, any thoughts on that? I, I marveled at going into their back war room, this, this team of prayer warriors that just kept coming in like waves and shifts, and then the, them just ready at the altar for the waves of students that just kept coming all throughout the time that I was there. Um, it was, I saw a beautiful unity intergenerationally of the spirit. It, I've not seen that in, in again, un, these, these people, some of them were strangers. Some of them didn't know each other. So this it wasn't like these were all hired hands. This was like on the fly, again, the spirit moving. What would you say, uh, Nick, as we try to wrap up here, what would you say one or two lessons that every nation campus around the world 
could learn from this. Uh, maybe it's a chapter leader, maybe it's campus missionaries, but w what does this say to us? I, I think for me, the thing that stands out is staying hungry for more of Jesus. And as the Bible says, don't, don't despise the day of small beginnings. No matter how large your campus group is, no matter how large your small group would look like, man, stay hungry for God and keep petitioning Him for a fresh revival and awakening. And God would do something. And the other thing that stood out to me as a leadership lesson, what I had a chance with uh, Dr. Brown, is being able to make godly decisions quickly in uncharted waters. Yeah. And he looked at me and he goes, we're in uncharted waters. We've got thousands of people coming. I've never prepped for this, yeah. never been a class for this, <clears throat> but being able to lead with gentleness. And knowing you're going to get criticized, no matter what you decide. Yeah. But still led with humility yeah. and gentleness really just challenged me as a leader. Mm. So those would be my Great. takeaways. Delvin, what would you say? Lessons for every nation people around the world, whether they're pastors working in a church or reaching the next generation or we're high schools or working on campus as a missionary? I think there was, uh, there was a brokenness over sin and a grieving of sin. And I think sometimes we talk about sin and we go, ah, it kind of hurt me. But the way that, they, that it was described and students testified, and uh, it, 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 was, it was almost as if the Holy Spirit didn't just convict people of sin. It's like He showed them the consequences of it. And it was almost as if uh, students that knew Christ or didn't know Him were able to finally get those burdens off of their chest. So I think just the main thing to take away is that brutal honesty about where someone is and the consequences of sin and just the, the brokenness that comes from that out to the Lord is like a fragrance offering. Delvin, Nick, thank you. Thank you for all you men do to lead our campus missionaries and to uh, wave the flag for campus ministry. Great job. Thanks for this. Thanks for this time. And as we, as we wrap up, uh, several lessons here. When I think about the revivals that, that I've read about in history coming out of a Wesleyan holiness movement, um, obviously, typically, they start with repentance, and there is a, a, a deep sense of repenting, turning from sin, and crying out to God. And that's been a part of each one of the Asbury revivals, and certainly was part of this one, that there was this, this acknowledgement, this brokenness, humility about sin. But that typically has led to great moments of worship, these extended 24-7 worship times with, without smoke machines, without keynote uh, designs, without, uh, with marginally talented musicians and singers, but none of that seemed to bother God. Uh, he showed up where there were humble, broken hearts crying out to Him. But there was also the lesson of the multi-generational uh, engagement on this, of the the elder states people, the more mature, older um, pastors and professors and, and administrators and presidents giving guidance but not control, mm -hmm. allowing the Holy Spirit to control and allowing the students, the next generation to lead. And boy, as a leader, that's a great lesson for us. I think about, um, I was empowered in my uh, late teens and early 20s in ways that very few people are allowed to be empowered anymore but what God can do through people that age if we will just kind of step back and coach and not control. Uh, I think we'll be amazed at what God might do. So um, this is what we pray for, believe God for, uh, live for seeing something like this, and I'm trusting it's going to spread to campuses all over the world right now. It started bouncing to Christian colleges all over America. I noticed the other day Texas A&M, one of the largest non-Christian schools in America, there were thousands of kids praying on campus, and it seems like it continues to spread all across the U.S., hopefully across the world. And it's amazing what God can do through students. Listen, at Every Nation, we always say it like this. We keep one foot in the community, one foot on the campus. We are called to uh, plant churches and campus ministries in every nation, and I trust that we will do that with a greater measure than ever before, believing for an outpouring of His Spirit on every one of our campuses.